Kia ora koutou as you're slowly trickling into this virtual space. We'll let a couple of seconds pass just to let people move into this space and um, we will formally welcome you. So we have 15, 16 join. We can probably get started. Kia ora koutou katoa, no mai, haramai. Welcome to this virtual space. Acknowledging all of you, the Indigenous lands you join us from, and this new virtual space we're occupying together. Um, before we get so, we will start with a karakia and then do formal introductions. So welcome to another Toi Caucus webinar. This is, um, I think, the seventh or eighth one for the year. So we're very busy offering these um, wonderful virtual spaces. And today we're very, very lucky and fortunate to have Dr. Mel Associate Professor Dr. Melanie Baresh from um, Otago University and Te Whare Tawharo. Um, so I'll let her do more of the more formal introduction while I do um, a little bit of virtual housekeeping. So many of you are really used to this space, but just a reminder that um, in the webinar space, you can't, um, we can't see you and you can't speak, but you can engage lively and actively in the chat. So we would invite you all to write who you are and where you're from in the chat. The chat has a little quirk. Automatically, Zoom only allows you as a default and directs all of your chat messages just to Melanie and myself. So if you want to talk to everyone, you have to click on the drop down uh, where it says all panelists and it will say all pan panelists and attendees. And that means you get to talk to everyone. So kia ora those who have already started putting everything in the chat. That's, um, you can engage with questions there, but there's also a Q&A box um, where you can, it's easier for us to store all the questions in the Q&A box. Don't worry if you can't find it, we will redirect all your questions there. For those who are new to this space and talking of sexual violence, um, we do put a bit of a reminder that talking about sexual violence for some is, is might be a new thing, might be something that you're not used to. So just keep in check of yourself, your own well-being, um, where this information sits and, and settles within yourself. And if it ever stirs up anything um, for yourself and your own history, um, I've put in the chat a link to Safe to Talk and I'll re-put it in throughout the session, um, which is our national helpline where you can access support and have a chat to someone if anything comes up. That is all from me. I think I haven't forgotten anything. And without further ado, I do hand over to um, Dr. Mali and thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Miriam, and tēnā koutou katoa. E mihi ana ki nā tohu e nehe o Otipote e noho nei o uh, ko Melanie Tokuingua. Uh, haramai, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, as Miriam said, uh, I work at the University of Otago and an associate professor in sociology and gender studies. Um, and I'm also the academic director of Tafare Tafaro, which is our university sexual violence support and prevention center. Um, so I will share my screen now um, and share the right screen. There we go. Um, so today what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, building a program or a series of strategies for prevention. Um, I'm happy to take questions at the end, but if there's anything along the way that um, you don't understand, if I'm using a term and um, and you need a little bit more of a definition or there's something that's not quite making sense, please do put something in the chat or the Q&A and Miriam will interrupt me um, so that we can work through it then rather than waiting until the end. Um, so I've titled my talk more than icing on a cake and I'm using a cake metaphor to think about um, and open a conversation really about um, how we build strategies for the prevention of sexual violence. So I'm not talking so much, although some of it does apply to specific workshops or um, sexual violence prevention events or materials, but thinking how we think more broadly about all of the work we do in the prevention space and how it fits together. Um, so the key learning goals, um, first off, just to understand the importance of using a prevention framework and logic. So I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by that um, when developing a sexual violence prevention strategy. 
for our communities and with our organizations. Um, a subset of that is to actually think about and understand the, what I think is the limited role of consent education in sexual violence prevention, and to th start thinking about how we can use the structure to make strategic decisions around what forms of prevention might best suit our community and how we can um, build prevention strategies around a range of different, um, different types of prevention. Um, so to start off with, um, this comes from Flood and colleagues, Michael Flood and colleagues at Vic Health in Australia, and says for effective prevention, um, we need, and they identify these key things. So a strong program framework and logic, a whole community approach. So one that involves all members of community. This is used a lot in schools. So thinking about students and teachers and Fanau and community more broadly. Um, you need effective delivery. The best program in the world won't be effective if it isn't delivered in a way that reaches people. It needs to be relevant, inclusive and culturally sensitive and in the Aotearoa context also um, ensure by cultural practice. And it needs to be evaluated so we can understand whether or not it works. So today what I'm gonna focus on is just that top one of having a strong program framework and logic. And so I wanted to introduce this to you today so you can get a sense of how this actually fits with a whole lot of other things when thinking about um, prevention. So in terms of talking about frameworks and what they do or logics and what they do, I'm borrowing here from Gillian Fletcher's concept of the black box. Um, and so all of my references are at the end. And so um, if you're interested in reading them, there you'll have the full reference a little bit later. Um, but what Gillian is saying in, in her chapter is that um, often the work that we do in prevention is we know heaps about sexual violence, we know what it is, we have a clear vision for what we want the world to be in terms of a violence-free community. But often what's missing is what she's calling this black box. So is a really clear articulation and understanding of how it is that the work we do is going to create a violence-free community or take steps towards a violence-free community. And so if I think about all of the different kinds of things that sometimes we do in terms of prevention, myth busting, consent, self-defense, bystander, empathy training, Fletcher really gets us to ask this question of how is it specifically, what is the actual mechanism that all of these different things help us move towards violence-free communities? Um, and I think that that's a really useful question to ask when we're starting to develop our, or expand and rethinking our prevention strategies. Um, so I'm doing lots of borrowing today. And so one type of framework that I think works really well, and here I'm borrowing from um, Nicola Gavey's work on the cultural scaffolding of rape. Um, her second edition of her book came out last year and it is an excellent read. So Nicola's work, um, and I think this will probably be familiar in some ways for many of you, points out the ways in which normative heterosexuality, normative sexualities um, create the scaffolding for rape. So here at the top tier, we have sexual violence, this problem that we're working to try and solve, um, rape, sexual violence, sexual harassment. But sitting underneath that um, is rape culture, which is a concept I'm guessing many of us are familiar with that can manifest in a range of different things, including victim, victim blaming and normalizing and minimizing of sexually violent behaviors. Um, and then underneath that is normative heterosexuality, our gendered norms, our ideas about masculinity and femininity, um, heteronormativity, also the colonial legacies that we have here in um, Aotearoa, and also recognizing that these are raced, classed, and also ableist power systems that shape um, the kinds of sexuality and sexual relationships that we can all build. And so Nicola's point is really clear that this kind of normative um, heterosexuality is not violence in and of itself, um, but it provides that scaffolding and that structure to maintain rape culture that also then maintains systems of sexual violence. Um, 
And so you can see the cake structure starting to develop here. Um, so we can also then turn and think that as a particular framework for organizing and thinking about different kinds of prevention strategies and what they do. So here I've kind of shifted to calling it the scaffolding of prevention. And so at the top in terms of things, and I'm going to go through each of these in a bit more detail in a minute, um, we have sexual violence at the top of it. And we have programs like um, rape resistance programs, offender programs that uh, target recidivism, programs for men. We have programs that address aspects of rape culture. And then we have programs that address aspects of uh, normative heterosexuality. And so here in terms of the prevention logics. And so I'm gonna start unpacking that black box a little bit now and talking about how it is that these different things move us towards a violence-free society. And so rape resistance, which are typically programs that are aimed um, that teach how to recognize and resist um, coercive and violent behaviors. So one key strategy here is empowerment self-defense. Um, so the work of the Women's Self-Defense Network is a good example. And um, there's a program called EAAA or Flip the Script that's also a really good example of this. And so EAAA in particular in the research has evidence that it reduces reductions in victimization by almost half for those who take it. So by providing skills in terms of how to recognize and respond to violence, um, people can prevent it from happening to themselves. And there's good research with Wisdom here also in Aotearoa that shows um, the research was conducted a bit differently and that's why the impacts I think are a bit different, but shows increase in efficacy in terms of using those strategies um, to, to, I guess, stop violence. Um, there's also a series of programs that work with offenders to reduce recidivism. These are often longer term group and individual therapy types programs, and they do show good evidence in terms of decreased recidivism. So decreasing the likelihood that an offender will reoffend. Um, so um, what that doesn't do though is help us prevent perpetrating behaviors um, before we know, like it takes someone to be first acknowledged as an offender. Um, and a lot of the programs that we have generally involve people with the criminal justice system before they get into these programs. So there are a series of programs for men that um, they were quite popular back in the 1990s when I was um, doing some of the frontline work. Um, and the goal of the program is to reduce perpetration. And the programs are aimed at mostly men and a general population of men. So rather than waiting until they're identified as offenders, working with them then. Um, they use various strategies, including some that use empathy-based um, mechanisms. Um, the problem with these is that the evidence around them is quite sketchy. There's one called Real Consent, which is an online program, which is starting to show some results in terms of actually reducing perpetration. Um, others lack a lot of evidence or some even show backlash effects, um, particularly some empathy-based programs. So that's a space where there, we need a lot of development. So that's how, so these programs are set to reduce sexual violence kind of um, perpetration specifically. So then the next tier down, we have rape culture. So here I put programs um, like a bystander program, which takes a community approach to prevention. The key message is that everyone has a responsibility to cont contribute to a society free from violence. And so it encourages people and gives people skills to be active bystanders. Um, so the evidence shows that this certainly can increase people's confidence or efficacy at be being an active bystander. And some of the evidence also shows it can increase bystanding behavior. Um, most often bystanders aren't present during assaults because isolation is a key component to, um, to sort of a key aspect that perpetrators use around assault. So 
often bystanders, what they are is interjecting in more precursor behaviors or those aspects of rape culture. So as an example, here's a poster from a social marketing campaign that we have here at the university. It says a few more drinks and she'll be DTF bro. That stands for down to fuck. Um, and someone saying, dude, I really need to stop you there. So it's those kinds of behaviors which are clearly connected to rape culture that I think bystanding programs have the strongest ability to, um, to intervene in, um, which may also prevent actual instances of sexual violence if you catch them early enough. Um, other programs that can address issues related to rape culture include um, programs or activities around myth busting that challenges rape myths really directly. Um, so these can reduce rape myth acceptance although we know that there is a tenuous link between attitudes and behaviors in general, not just for sexual violence prevention. And so it's not clear, again, how those will um, connect to the sexual violence behaviors. And similarly, awareness programs to increase awareness of the issue of sexual violence and its um, all its facets and complexity also can change knowledge and attitudes towards sexual violence, which contributes to um, to rape, crisis, uh, to rape culture. And it can also spur some and support further work and in involving in prevention. So someone doing one program might spark their interest in getting more involved in doing more programs. And so that's sort of the types of programs that I see that are really um, focused on challenging rape culture specifically. And then if we move to the bottom tier, of our cake, the foundation of our cake is where I would put things like healthy relationships education, comprehensive sexuality education, the challenging of gendered norms, decolonizing work, challenging of um, systemic power structures that um, support the cultural scaffolding of rape. Um, so these support the development of healthy and ethical relationships and they really the potential here, I think, connected to change is really contributing to long-term social change and contributing to increased social equality. And so these ones are more the long game. So I often think of, I can go here, the programs here at the top, the different kinds of programs are, um, I see them as sort of more of a short term, like how do we address these behaviors in the here and now? And as we get down to the bottom tier of the cake around normative heterosexuality, it's about playing the long game for long-term um, social change. And you'll see that I've added some layers of ganache to our lovely cake model here. Um, and one of the things that's really important is that those programs that make up these top two tiers, that they're also consistent with this bottom tier of the cake and that they too build on, um, on the bottom layer as well in terms of challenging social norms and gendered norms and doing that work as well. Um, so as an example here, um, I think rape resistance is a really clear example. Um, and particular if we think about different forms of uh, self-defense programs, so there are some self-defense programs that are offered that do not um, build on this base layer here and instead can end up reinforcing um, problematic social norms and gender norms. And those tend to be less effective than programs that actually build on this and have a recognition of the social impacts of sexual violence and the and um, and power structures within their program. So here um, I have a citation for Belle Murphy, who's a PhD student here and a wisdom instructor, and she's really doing some um, excellent work looking at how empowerment, self-defense in particular, is different from other prevention strategies. Um, and she doesn't put it in this structure, um, but I hope that she doesn't feel like I'm altering her work too much to say that in one way, what she's saying is that um, that empowerment self-defense, which we know has a strong way of working, builds on these bottom two 
tiers as well. And so that's really important in terms of thinking about how those things all fit together. Um, so there is a notable absence in the types of prevention programs that I've talked about so far. And so what about consent education? And where does consent education fit into our cake of prevention? And so the first question I ask is, what is the logic of consent education? What is in this black box? Um, and how is it that consent education contributes to violence-free communities? So if we have a look at um, consent education, and a couple of years ago, I, I did an analysis of um, consent social marketing materials. And there's two real main messages that come out clearly in terms of consent education. Um, and that is they talk about what consent is and they talk about how to communicate consent. And so you can kind of see that in some of these, um, these posters here. And I know I can't read that either, but basically that consent is clear, coherent, willing and ongoing. Um, it's the difference between sex and rape and that sort of thing. So those are the two things. Um, also, it's important to point out that often messages about consent present what I call an idealized version of consent rather than a definition of consent with the legal version. Um, so, for example, um, some programs will talk about enthusiastic consent, and there is no law anywhere that requires enthusiasm to be present um, in a legal capacity in terms of determining the difference between um, sexual violation and okay sex, right? And so um, we certainly want to be teaching to a standard well above the law, like the legal standard I think is quite a low standard. And so um, we certainly don't want to be just teaching to what that legal standard is and, and teaching to something that we just want people to be just barely above that legal standard of consent. So I think focusing on things like enthusiastic consent um, you can see where it's come from and, and why there's been that desire and push to there. Um, but the problem, it introduces though a problem in that consent means different things in different contexts. And so consent is a legal term that means something very specific, but then an education is now being used in a range of different ways that some are consistent with the legal definition and some are not. So is this work um, rape prevention? And uh, I conducted another study a couple of years ago where I interviewed people involved in consent education, involved in developing the programs and delivering the programs. Um, and here's a really interesting quote from someone um, that I interviewed. And this study was, uh, I interviewed people in a number of English speaking countries, including the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And so here, Debbie, that's her pseudonym, says, I don't know if what we're doing is rape prevention. Are we stopping people who are going to do this behavior from doing it? Probably not. If they are on that extreme end of this is how I gain power in the world and they have a sense of entitlement and control, I find that very hard to change. And I've seen a few perpetrators in my work as a counselor and it's like they don't want to change. There's no, no motivation for them. So yeah, I don't see it as rape prevention. And so I find this quote really compelling and really interesting and also um, quite consistent with some of my own thinking around um, consent. Um, and so I wanna explore this idea a little bit more about consent education is not rape prevention, which may be a little bit harsh, right? Um, and so one of the things is that because miscommunication is not the cause of rape. So if miscommunication, we'll go back to my black box here, if miscommunication was the problem, if, if the reason why there is so much sexual violence in the world is because of miscommunication, then consent education that teaches people how to communicate would then lead to violence-free societies. But miscommunication is not the problem. And um, 
I won't go in depth into a lot of the research here, but um, people, including young people, do and can understand complex forms of communication, including communication about sex. So my own work um, reflects this, as well as the work of others, including Kitzinger and Frith, um, who did some conversational analysis and demonstrated that women say no to sex in the same ways that they say no to all sorts of other social interactions. And O'Byrne and Rapley and colleagues who did work with men who demonstrated that they could actually um, hear and understand no's and, and, and whatnot. So miscommunication is not the cause of, um, of sexual violence. And I'd like to put forward the idea here that it's actually that the belief in miscommunication that's more of a problem, right? Because when young people are inundated with messages about what consent is and telling them how to consent, underlying all of those messages is the assumption that they don't know already. So I worry then that they think it's not surprising or unusual if something is, if someone isn't listening to them because they're constantly being told in, in an underhanded way that underlying assumption that they don't already know it, what um, consent is or how to understand someone's willingness to participate in sex. And so it shouldn't be surprising that someone crosses a boundary. Um, so instead, I think it's the belief in miscommunication that's the problem, the belief that somebody won't understand, the beliefs connected to rape culture and normative sexuality that send messages that like women say no and they mean yes, or that once they go so far, they're obligated to continue or that men need to stop. So in other words, I think that part of the issue with consent education is that it's aimed at the wrong tier of the cake. And so it's seen as rape prevention in terms of being in that top tier. But if we treat it that way, then it ignores the bottom two tiers. And often a lot of consent education is presented in a very degendered way, which doesn't reflect sexual violence. And also then ignores all of those messages and issues around rape culture and normative heterosexuality that really shape the ways in which people um, engage in sex and what they say yes to or no to. So what can consent education do? In some ways, I think it can support prevention. It can help build healthier relationships. I think teaching people how to talk with their partners about sex can only be a good thing in terms of building great relationships and um, exploring pleasure and all sorts of things. This may then also have the potential to foster new norms, which then has the potential to help people recognize coercive behavior. So if we change things, so expect that our partners are going to be open and talking about things and that they respect and hear our no's, whether they're verbal or not, then we may be quicker to recognize um, that kind of coercive behavior. Um, but it can, I think, also impede prevention, particularly when we focus on that language of consent, when we present um, different messages about what consent is that are not consistent with legal definitions. And as I've just unpacked, it has the potential to reinforce the myth of miscommunication. So where does it fit in our little cake? So I would put communicative sexuality down here, which can help you know, challenge aspects of normative heterosexuality. And also some, um, put it up here in terms of uh, awareness, in, in terms of talking about the legal definition and understanding of consent. So now we have a plain cake with ganache between some layers, pulling the three tiers together. It's delicious, but it might be a little bit boring on its own. We might want to add some icing and decorations. And so here's where I think about the role of things like social marketing campaigns, take back the night marches, various fun events and activities, um, painting murals, art installations, bake sales, all of this stuff. And <clears throat> the importance of all of these things is it provides persistent and consistent messaging. Um, it reminds people within the community of all of those key messages. So we're not always having to do workshops and things like that. It connects prevention work together. So if we've got different programs running, it can help draw those threads together and really can bring people into the conversation. So part of my thinking around this came from going to conferences 
um, where it was talked about at other universe, uh, with universities talking about what they do in prevention. And there was a lot of presentations from um, people at universities who were talking about the great prevention work they were doing and they painted a mural. And I'm like, painting a mural is a great thing. It's not gonna lead to behavior change. And I think I started this journey on the other side where I was really concerned about the cake. I wanted facilitated workshops that were aimed at skills and behavior change. And so what I think I learned from that is that we need the cake we also need the icing and decorations too. And I think my learning for this on our campus in particular is that we need to bring people into the conversation and we can have the best workshop in the world being offered. Um, if people aren't going to attend it, it's not going to be effective. And so this is where the full cake comes to its realization is that we actually do need all of that stuff because let's face it, a cake without Icing is a wee bit boring. So I want to have time for a conversation. Oh, I'm just, yeah, um, looking at the time. So to give you a bit of an example about all of this stuff and what I mean, I'll just go through a little bit about some of the work that we do at the University of Otago and, um, and how it works and how it fits with um, with this particular structure. So, and these are the acronyms for the various programs, which I'll describe in a minute. So at the base layer here, we have what we call community, uni in big letters, 102, which is essentially a social norms. I call it a consent program by stealth because um, we developed this program here. A lot of my research is on consent and I was really reluctant for the reasons I mentioned earlier to produce a consent program, but that's what people wanted. Um, so I say this is like a consent program with stealth because it doesn't focus so much, it doesn't focus at all actually on how to communicate about sex. Instead, it talks about the social norms that um, constrain and influence sexual behavior. And there's also a strong component around alcohol and blackout drinking um, because that's also an issue in our community that we're dealing a lot with. Um, so that provides the foundation and does really challenge those um, social norms and it's delivered to um, this year, this coming year, this year is delivered to about 80% of students that are in residential colleges and at our university about 80% of first year students live in residential colleges so that's a really good way to get in um, to get most students as they start university. Um, then our second tier, we have a bystander program that we use, which is called bringing in the bystander. Um, and again, that challenges rape culture, gives people skills around how to be a bystander. At the top tier, we have EAAA or Flip the Script, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and one of my colleagues in preventative medicine piloted a program called Real Consent, which was aimed um, at men with the goal of reducing perpetration, but it's not currently offered um, on our campus for a whole host of reasons, um, mostly because of licensing issues, because it was still in development and, and whatnot. So we have these three programs, but then we have our social marketing awareness events and disclosure training, and these sit on our cake plate of um, policy and support services and other things that contribute to that. But this is not complete. Um, so this is sort of the work that the university has been involved with, but also there's a lot of really great student activism on our campus that also really contributes to making things complete and getting the community involved. In particular, um, at the moment, our Thursdays in Black initiatives, which are a nationwide um, program. So, to go back to the beginning, I've talked a lot about the strong program framework and logic, and I've used a metaphor of a cake to think through how it is um, and what it is that we do and how we can think strategically of our, of street, I guess our strategic framework around prevention and how all of those bits and different types of prevention programs can work together. Um, 
So now I just want to remind that this is just one part of designing a program of prevention strategy. And there's those other aspects around a whole community approach around effective delivery, um, relevant and inclusive and kind of evaluation. So I've only really talked about um, a short part of that. So concluding thoughts, um, the design of prevention strategies should really clearly articulate the mechanism through which they are preventing sexual violence. Um, and so this scaffolded approach to prevention of this cake can really take advantage of all of the strengths of different approaches. And so thinking about an organization working through um, a strategic plan for prevention, then, you know, ensuring that there are strategies that sit across those different tiers of the cake, I think is particularly useful. And ensuring then that all of those, like the ganache that pulls them together are consistent, that the top tiers then are consistent with the bottom tiers. Um, in terms of the messaging, in terms of them challenging social norms and that kind of thing. Um, I think we should rethink consent education and the role it plays in the prevention. It's not that I don't think it has a role, um, but again, that understanding that black box and what it really has the potential to do, um, I worry that it's too often seen as the silver bullet that's going to solve the problem of sexual violence prevention. Um, and I think it's a lot more complex than that. So um, these are my references. I know the text Hopefully you can read it. I'll leave it up here because this will be on YouTube. And so you can always pause the video at this point if you're interested in looking at any of the references. Um, and beyond that, thank you for listening. And I'm really looking forward to engaging in some conversation. Sure, Melanie, thank you so much for that um, presentation. We do have a few questions coming through. Um, I wondered if you could pop back to the cake with all the different programs because we did have someone um, who missed um, just all the different uh, acronyms, if we could. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just the acronyms, what they stand for, because um, you said them at the very beginning and then people just missed. Um, oh, right. So the bottom one is Community 102. That's a program that we created here um, based a lot on the research that I do around consent. Um, it will hopefully be available. We're doing some more research on it this coming year. And so then hopefully you can make it available more broadly if anybody's interested in it. This one is bringing in the bystander, um, which is one of the bystander programs that has really strong evidence for it. And it's designed to be adaptable to the space and location um, in which it, it, that it's at. So the, um, it's from New Hampshire in the US, but even when they go to different colleges in the US, they um, need to adapt it for those specific colleges. EAAA stands for the Enhanced Assess Acknowledge Act. Um, it's now also known as Flip the Script, and it's a Canadian rape resistance program um, specifically for women identified people. It teaches them how to, uh, and specifically also designed for first year university women, um, teaches them how to recognize coercive behavior um, and respond to it. I also put WISDEN here because Belle Murphy does do a lot of WISDEN programs um, on our campus. And there's teachers nationwide. It stands for the Women's Self-Defense Network. I believe they might be changing their name soon. But I'm not sure. Um, and this one is Real Consent, which is an online program um, that it came out of the US. And I put it here because we have piloted it at our campus. One of my colleagues, uh, Shamala Nadaraja in preventative medicine had uh, piloted it. And it is the program that shows the most promise at this point for addressing sort of um, perpetrating behaviors at a sort of before offenders are acknowledged. Yeah, great. So um, just before we delve into more in-depth um, questions, I thought we'll get through some of the admin questions. So um, are you happy for people to receive a copy of your slides? Yes. Um, I can email them all out afterwards. So um, for those who are wondering, yes, we will email those out for you. And um, for, for those who have registered, um, normally the process is once um, the link is live online on YouTube, I send an email to all of those who have participated 
so you will not be notified when the recording is up. Okay, so now we've sorted those um, nice and easy questions. Um, um, there was a comment that's come through anonymously in terms of um, the response of actually the research that you did around um, one of the counsellors' uh, reactions to um, doing counselling with people with harmful behaviour and how they thought um, that they couldn't change. So I'm just wondering, um, and then also what we know around perpetrate, like uh, programs for those with harmful sexual behaviours. So I found that um, kind of an interesting comment and wondered if you what you thought of the comment as well. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So she was saying that they have no impetus to change and so are reluctant to change. And yet I also said that these programs tend to be effective. Um, and so I think part of it is that my understanding of the counseling that that particular person was doing um, was she wasn't um, engaged in a particular program. Um, so this isn't my area of specialty. Uh, there is someone on our campus, Tess Patterson, who does a lot of work in this space. Um, and so, and the programs within New Zealand and that person wasn't from New Zealand that have shown effectiveness are quite structured and intentional therapy kinds of techniques so that I don't think that that particular counselor was engaging in. Mm. The other interesting thing in talking with Tess that she said um, in relation to that work is that denial is a protective factor. So for people who are identified as offenders who go into this kind of counseling, who approach it with, I don't know why I'm here, I didn't do anything wrong. That's actually a protective factor in terms of recidivism. And she said, when she works with them, she doesn't challenge that directly. Instead, her approach is, well, that may be the case, but you got yourself in trouble and are here. So how can we make sure you don't land up here again? Yeah. Um, and and so and I think that that does have to do with a little bit of that what that person mentioned in that comment of they just don't care, right? And so if they say I'm an offender, this is who I am, and I don't have that, that's a lot harder to work with than somebody who says, well, I don't know why I'm here. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, Kayla, well, let's talk about how you can not come back here and that seems to be a lot, which is counterintuitive, um, but I also think. I suppose it goes back to some of what we know in terms of that behaviour change of um, how do we understand the motivations for doing the behaviour in the first place and then the motivations for changing. And I think, um, you yeah. know, what you're highlighting around, you know, the underlying cause is not miscommunication. There might be other factors. Um, and, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this also from an unconscious level you know often lots of our behaviorist mechanisms are very conscious and there might be also other unconscious drivers that we're not actually um, factoring into some of our strategies so that's really interesting too. Yeah and I think that um, similarly I mentioned that programs empathy programs show backlash effects which I think is also tied into all of this yeah. um, and I was having a talk with Kitty Tapu Murray who does work in this space here, um, she works at the Maori Center here. And I mentioned that to her and as a psychotherapist, she's like, well, of course, she said, empathy programs are gonna have backlash effects. Cause she said, you hold a mirror up to somebody and if they're not ready to look in that mirror and see what they may be doing, then their response might be to really push against it, right? That to have the other defense mechanism might, they've got accessible to go, I don't wanna look at the mirror. That's right. Yeah. And then, yeah. And so, you know, she's like, from her perspective, that work needs to be done in a therapy kind of situation where you can prepare somebody and get them ready to look in that mirror rather than in a group prevention program with all your, these programs are often run in either fraternities or sports teams, you know, with all your mates on your football team and putting up that mirror. <laughs> yep. Fascinating. Um, so here's another question. Um, uh, this person's been thinking a lot about the mismatch between definitions of consent um, that is, are used in consent education, which are education settings that you mentioned as well, and the legal definitions. And we did do a webinar a few a while back, which we delved into the legal definitions. So that's alive for a few, I think, on the on the group. Mm -hmm. Have you got any suggestions on how to address that difference, how, um, given how very low and problematic the legal definitions are? especially case law is taken, especially when case law is taken into account. Yeah, that's a, oh, 
Yeah, that's something I've been thinking about and grappling in terms of the language that we use. Um, I think where I've kind of settled is respectful and mutual relationships. Um, and, you know, building respect and mutuality um, within that. I don't have the perfect language or response for that at the moment. Mm. Um, I'm just really cautious of using consent to mean um, too many different things. And, I, and that, although that is the approach that we take in Community 102 is we actually make that point really clearly that the legal definition is presents it a bar here. And a lot of this stuff and work that we do is around um, social the social pressures that also contribute to sexual harm and point out that it's so there's a whole other lot of things that um, that are going on that create harm but don't meet a legal definition of um, sexual violation for a lot of reasons and so where we go to is respectful and mutual. I suppose if we took your program logic of the black box analogy it'd also be really interesting to think about what what are we hoping um, to like what, what is the mechanism that talking about the law will have like do we assume that talking about legal definitions is a deterrent for behavior and and you know just thinking about it from that logic program logic perspective as well like yeah, yeah and I don't think that talking about the legal definition is a deterrent um, but I think what it can do is uh, and I guess what I have seen it do and this is more as a back in the day as a support worker is, sometimes sharing, having someone come in to our crisis center and say, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know if this fits for me, but this is what happened. And I would sometimes share with them the legal definition in Canada. And this was in Canada, so it was a bit different. And that would help them see that what happened to them and, and help them sort of work through what they thought of, of their own thing. So I think it can be helpful there, but then it, again, is limited because it is such a low bar. Um, particularly if you think about alcohol mm. and, and what it means. And I've seen some education programs say things like, if you're too drunk to drive a car, you're too drunk to consent to sex. That certainly doesn't bear out in our legal system. No, um, I definitely. So, yeah. Um, yeah. This other person has a message through in terms of what your thoughts around teaching critical reading of pornography as a prevention strategy and where you might, I'm just going to add to their question, where you might put it in your own framework of the cake layering. Let me think. That's an excellent question and one that comes up um, more and more. I guess I would put, I think it is, and I think increasingly is becoming a potentially important part of the lovely cake. Um, and maybe across both rape culture and, he and normative um, heterosexuality. And so I think it comes into these bottom two layers in terms of thinking about, um, you know, what we see in pornography, is that reflective of the kinds of, well, of reality or the kinds of relationships that we want to foster. Um, and so, and I think there's space for both and there's ways in which pornography can uphold rape culture and so challenging that and certainly ways that it can um, contribute to norms around um, femininity and masculinity. Absolutely. And just heteronormativity and to, as well at, at different times. And uh, um, what well, I just jumped out as you were talking was healthy relationships that might not always um, be role modeled in um, pornography as we know. Um, the next question was around um, just uh, someone reflected that they had a bit of a reaction to rape resistance mm. um, in terms of understanding that process of um, really like the how sometimes self-defense programs can reinforce those myths, which you did address in your cake layering. I wonder if we can expand on that because we know that there's lots of different self-defense programs out there and I've attended some myself which recommended that I always walk around everywhere with keys in my hand because I was responsible always for my safety um, and others where it's been more empowering and um, challenging the scripts as um, you know I really like the term flipping the script mm -hmm. um, so I wondered if you have any other thoughts around that you'd like to share yeah and I think that is <clears throat> oh, pardon me that is um, 
I'm glad that that brought up because that is often a response. And to be honest, that was my initial response when I started hearing about um, rape resistance as a strategy. Um, because we don't want to responsibilize those who are most likely to experience sexual violence for preventing it, right? Um, and so I think, Mary, you touched on a couple of really important keys and that's like the devil is in the details. And so it's what kind of rape resistant strategy. Um, there is the reference that I do have at the end to Belle Murphy's work. <clears throat> um, she has a chapter in a book that really actually pulls that apart quite in a lot of detail. The short version is really about how the ones that are effective dismantle, actively dismantle victim blaming. So they actively dismantle rape culture and they actively also challenge um, a lot of our social norms that feed into sexual violence. And so, yeah, I remember one that I went to told me that I should put my bed about that far away from the wall. And that way, if I was ever attacked in my bed, I could push the perpetrator into the gap between the bed and the wall and then run away. Whereas the approach that wisdom takes and that EAAA takes as well is not a should. It's not like here's a bunch of tools to combat this usually stranger kind of person. It's embedded in the realities of our lives. And its approach is um, often women are taught that they're not strong enough, that they're not capable. Mm -hmm. um, and so it puts that on its head. And rather than saying, this is what you should do in this case, it says, we're gonna give you a whole bunch of tools that you can put in your toolbox. And we know that if any, if you ever need them, you will do the best thing in the moment that's for you. Whether that's staying silent, whether that's running away, whether that's using some self-defense techniques, um, that it's really clear that the only person that can decide the best course of action in any given moment is that individual. Um, and so we'll put a whole bunch of other tools in their toolbox and they may be helpful and they may not be in any given situation. Um, and those programs show like EAAA really clearly and I'm convinced Wisden would as well show um, decreased victim blaming and that those who have experienced sexual violence after taking EAAA or flip the script actually blame themselves less um, and take on less of this. So, um, but again, and this is why the cake is so important because it's not the single strategy that will work. If all we did was that, well, that actually, and someone points out that doesn't change perpetrating behaviors, right? It doesn't um, change, it just shifts. And some people were like, well, it might just shift then who gets assaulted at a population level, right? Um, and so my perspective is that it, and again, deals with the here and now and provides some really helpful skills and tools to people who are more likely to experience forms of sexual violence. But we can't just do that. We have to also engage in the rest of it. Very good. Um, so this ties in quite well in terms of um, someone's asking, um, do you have any thoughts about national and local and how much needs to be co-developed and supported and resourced at a sorry, how much needs to be co-developed, supported and resourced at a national level compared to a local level or within an organization or a community? So it's kind of that where, yeah. how, how does all of the, how does the cake get developed? And is there a cake for each community or do we have some pieces of the cake that we share across? Just to Maybe keep we, using your cake metaphor. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, one of the trends is to use like little cupcakes at weddings. So maybe we need to have like the big tiered, like, cupcake thing with each of us have our own little cakes because I think oh that's an interesting and I think a tough question um I think what I'd like to see at the national level is some more of this stuff down here and if I think about social marketing campaigns and think about things like the it's not okay campaign and the champions and whatnot that can get that sort of spread but different communities also have very different characteristics and are ready for different kinds of engagement and for different kinds of prevention. And so I think a full on national approach is not, um, I think we need a balance between the two. Um, and I guess if we, if I was to design my dream plan, um, maybe a, an overarching strategy that lays out this bottom layer really clearly in terms of 
what are the key messages that are important and that we need to challenge these norms and, and do this work while also providing space within individual communities to address the needs of their local communities. Um, and that's where that this comes into in terms of this whole community approach and who is our community? Is it our school? Is it our now? Is it our um, city? Is it our, our neighborhood or is it our country? Um, and I think we need um, some balance. There's another concept around readiness to change. And so different communities. So for instance, in communities and places and spaces where people are like, well, this isn't a problem. I don't see what the issue is. Then your approach and your strategy where you're starting off here might be really in this awareness space. So people, in order to get up to here and to do some of even like the bystander work, there first of all needs to be an understanding that there is actually a problem, right? And so some communities may be at, at that point and other communities may be like, woohoo, there's this is a problem and I wanna do something about it, what can I do? And then, so then the strategies within those communities might be different too. And so potentially yeah. that cupcake analogy is starting to form as well. They might just have a cupcake, a few cupcakes with the top two tiers type of icing. Then, you know, they could could be a good um, could be a good extra analogy to add on from the metaphor is expanding. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, this um this ties in really well to this next question um, and uh, where this person's asking, isn't it a mistake to think about the cause in terms of individual motivational causes? There are things are always embedded within social interactions and other societal institutions. Furthermore, keep hold of historical trajectories of these things. It's very complex, but it worries me when we target, um, when the target is on individuals to change, which I think um, ties in a little bit with that concept of cultural ready, um, sorry, community readiness and how, um, and how we conceptualize that within our prevention strategies. Yeah, absolutely. And when I do talk, and, I, and thank you for that comment, because when I talk about cause, I, I don't mean those individual things. And there certainly are individual factors. But I guess that in some way is also the difference between working up here at this tier, which it tends to individualize causes. And when you get down to this tier here, this is all about social, right? Oopsie. It's all about those social norms. And um, and the social causes. And that's why this tier is really important, which I think is also, if we think about the rape resistant strategies and different forms of self-defense is some of the ones that we really bristle with, or that I bristle with, um, are ones that really individualize it, right? If I just keep my bed that far away from the wall and stand next to elevator buttons and do all of those things, then I'll be safe. Whereas those rape resistance programs that do work actually really um, explicitly acknowledge the social. And so when I think about causes embedded in there is, is all of the social, but I recognize that's not the way that lots of people talk about the causes. Um, and I think then you end up sort of staying up here in a way that ignores this part down here. And tying into causes, um, another viewer is asking, to, and they do state it as, as playing devil's advocate, advocate a little bit. Um, so is, is it misguided to focus on sexual violence? So, uh, sorry, let me restart that. Um, to play devil's advocate a little, is the focus on sexual violence possibly misguided since it's about power rather than sex? Right. Um, that's an interesting question. And so I guess what comes to mind first when I think about that is other forms of violence as well, um, in terms of intimate partner violence, domestic violence, family violence, and a range of different things. I don't think that focusing on sexual violence means that you're focusing specifically on sex. I think you can, and I think with this kind of structure, it it is focusing um, on power, again, and not just sex. I think the interesting question there, though, is do we need, is it better to focus narrowly on something like sexual violence or sexualized violence? Or should we be working in programs that address 
um, power and violence more directly and more specifically. Um, and again, I think that's also, so the work at the bottom of this tier, I think would also contribute to similar, in similar kinds of ways to um, relationship violence and other forms of violence as well. Um, but I still think that this work is also necessary in terms of the, the rape resistance for the here and now. So I think there's some of the activities that we can do that do challenge power across a range of different and can address power and also racism um, and other forms of, of power as well. Um, but when we have limited time and limited resources and we're doing programs, if we try to do too much, it can, it can trouble things a little bit. And so yes, we do need more of the stuff that doesn't also um, focus just on sexual violence. Um, and bystander stuff is a really interesting example there because bystander work can also be really helpful for um, anti-racist work as well, for instance, that's not sexual violence. And so, and that's one of the things that we've grappled with, with our bystander program, do we stay just focused on sexual violence or do we also then include scenarios and information about um, anti-racist bystander work as well. And you could also incorporate some um, homophobia and transphobia type response, you know, it's any of those things that you're seeing that uh, someone's being targeted for whatever reason, how can you step in and be, um, you know, a, a good member of society that helps out others as, as a simple way of putting it. And I think there's some interesting thought around um, I'm thinking in particular of those who harm children and um, sometimes it's not just about power, there are other reasons why people might also um, have that behaviour towards, you know, have that very harmful behaviour towards children. So I think um, it's complex and that's why I think, you know, each type of sexual violence we're trying to prevent might need a really good in-depth um, scaffolding and potentially different cakes that sit on the same table of, um, <laughs> <laughs> we're having a feast <laughs> we're having a feast of cakes um so for those who are funders on the and those who are in government on the call please think about you know funding a feast of cakes not just the wine cake please yeah <laughs> um, which ties in um to the next question around um what layer do you see the major investments of money or resources going to here in Aotearoa oh my initial thought is I want I want across the board. I don't want one, I guess um, this bottom layer building on the last question about do we just focus on sexual violence? Um, this bottom layer has the potential to contribute to the prevention of a lot of um, problematic behavior and a lot of interpersonal violence, racism and whatnot. Um, so I guess what I would like to see, I'm gonna dodge the question a little bit and rather talk about how much funding what I would like to see is more collaboration. So um, I'm not sure how it ended up, but you know, the, the separation in government between sexual violence funding and family violence funding, I find curious, um, you know? And so that would be a space where those two groups like ACC and MSD could actually work fruitfully together um, to start building those consistent and persistent kinds of things. Um, so I guess in that way, we need the solid foundation. And if we could build a foundation that had then multiple different tiers up where we had the sexual violence, then specific stuff, and we had, um, you know, domestic violence specific stuff and anti-racism specific stuff, all with this common tier. Mm. Again, if I had a magic wand, then, um, then that's where I would go. But I wouldn't want to. So I think in that way, this one has the potential for more resourcing as long as it's used in a way that expands just beyond sexual violence. And I'm, I'm wondering if you've thought much about the specialization of the workforce along those tiers, because I find, um, especially when, when you might have generic sexual health education, but don't come from a trauma-informed sexual violence lens, some of those conversations miss the nuance, so they might be very well informed in terms of um, 
the part of sexual health education that is more around the body and STIs and all of that element, but not around the social, like the psychological, emotional um, interaction of what a healthy relationship might look like. So I wonder if you've had actually any thoughts of workforce and, you know, which tier is the, you know, needs more, um, what, what levels of specialization does each tier require, I suppose, is, or are they all equally, they need to be specialized and, um, and very well versed in, in particular sexual violence prevention? Yeah, I would see again, this bottom tier is foundational across whether it's sexuality education um, or, or anything like this is, it is, this really is the foundational tier. Um, and then if I think about specialization, like the programs up here, like the offenders programs to the, the clinicians, the therapists that run those programs are highly specialized and highly trained. Um, and, you know, and so they should, I would have the understanding of both of these layers down here, I would, I would hope. Um, but that is really highly specialized. And same thing with the rape resistance. Um, you know, the wisdom instructors are generally, I think, trained about a year and they do a range of things over the course of a year before they go out to teach self-defense because there's a lot um, embedded in there. So this, I think, is foundational and should be, if we think about the workforce foundational across, I would say, sexuality education, um, sexual violence space, domestic violence, family violence space, anti-racist space, where we talk about normative, um, where we broaden it out from just normative sexuality and heterosexuality and heteronormativity to um, power structures and normative ways of being. And then I guess specialize within that. But then again, bystander stuff could, like I said, could span the broad. So I think as you move up the tier, you get more and more specialized. Right, thank yeah. you. Um, within your research around consent education, are there findings from a cultural perspective or cultural approaches as well? Um, I can think of so different definitions of cultural. Um, so, do they mean? Do you know if they mean cultural in so? so shall we explore a few of them that we can assume? So they'll be ethnic, cultural, but also in terms of geography and country, as well as um, thinking of the communities of belonging like um, LGBTQI or... Yeah. Um, ethnic approach, uh, we've, got a, we've got a follow up. So specifically around um, Pacific, um, ethnic approaches like Pacifica Māori. Yeah, this is a question that I've been talking with, with a colleague of mine who also works in this space. And what we suspect, and this colleagues in Canada, is the short answer is no, that there, well, there's very limited. I think in the US now they're starting to come up with some research around consent within African American or Latino communities. But interestingly, consent work in terms of research is very Pakeha. And I um, am starting to suspect, and I would love to chat with some people about this, about its, its utility is really, it seems to be embedded within sort of a very Western and neoliberal kind of way of thinking. Um, this colleague of mine and I were, were trying to look, and one of the things we we're trying to do is to look globally and to find research that embeds the work around consent in different cultural contexts. And there really isn't a lot. And part of me thinks that maybe that's because the concept just doesn't translate easily and is, um, is really embedded within a very Western and neoliberal kind of sensibility, um, which I find really exciting because I kind of hope that maybe we can have some other conversations kind of blowing apart other ways of thinking about um, about what we're doing in that space. Well, we'll take you up on the potential of having that conversation because I think there's a few in our network that will be very interested to unpack and, um, those concepts together because I think yeah, uh, I think also there's some interesting linguistic elements of consent mm -hmm. doesn't always translate easily across languages meaning the same thing. So potentially yeah. other cultures and languages are 
talking about similar aspects but using different linguistic terms. So, mm-hmm. so uh, figuring out what what are we, which part of it are we actually trying to compare? Yeah, that's right. And maybe the like, like if the language is more around like our thinking around respect and mutuality, well, that's something different again. Um, which are concepts I think translate better. Yeah. Um, even, yeah, there's more cross-cultural translations that will be then embedded within the cultural context of what respect and mutuality might mean That's um, true. compared to some a term that comes from a, quite a legal framework as well. So, mm. yeah, interesting. Yeah, and historically, consent is a very liberal concept. And, um, you know, if we go back to those philosophers of old, it was intended to to reflect um, someone's consent to be governed by the local kind of place. So basically said that because we are here, because I'm living in Aotearoa, New Zealand, I am thereby consenting to abide by and held accountable to the laws and rules of this place, um, which is very tacit, which is not the way that we like to think about sexual consent as something that's very active. Um, that just by virtue of being here, I am consenting to certain things. That's the original kind of definition of consent. So in some ways, there is a really big mismatch between the concept and idea of consent and what we're trying to achieve in terms of sexuality education. And the last question, and thank you for those who are still online. Um, So it it ties into the conversation we're having before, and I think it's, uh, I left it until last because I think it connects quite well with Um, broader systems that our prevention strategies come up uh, against and that can either you know create actually very devastating negative effects um, that all of our good prevention efforts then hit against um, which is is a movement towards the court system being interested in these ideas my thinking is while perpetrators are not called into account at this level what is the motivation for them to train so really thinking about um, so, you know, whether it's in your local community, but thinking about those broader structures and how they um, keep this issue very alive and well and healthy or actually start shifting society into a different direction and where you see that fitting. All right. So um, just to clarify, is the question about um, institutionalized power generally in the way that it perpetuates rape culture and sexual violence or is it about the handling specifically of perpetrators within offenders in our court systems answer both because both of those are interesting questions <laughs> the person wanted the first one around um courts and uh, how offenders are treated, but both of those questions are fabulous so <laughs> um so i guess just talk about institutions um and i think there is a question there in general about you know, changing institutions. Um, and I guess oh, that's a challenging question. And where, where I go to with it is in terms of pressure from within and work f- within and without. And so work from within institutions as well as work outside of institutions. Um, and the work that I've chosen to do is to work within an institution Right, which does come with costs. And there have been moments where I thought I was selling my soul. Um, But at the same time, I have working within can create one kind of change, I think. Um, But we also need the working without. So all of that activism that happens, that pushes institutions in a different way. And I guess what I would wish would happen in that space more than it does is that those of us who work within and those of us who work without would actually get together and and work more cohesively and say, okay, yeah, you go and um, you work within. And, you know, sometimes I put things in certain ways or sometimes I don't say things or call people on things because intentionally because I'm hoping to move a li- the institution a little bit further, right? So there's, like I said, there's costs to that and that people who are working from the outside can say things that I can't. That doesn't mean that I don't support them and I might be going like, yay, go push, <laughs> right? And so I think in that way, um, what I wish would happen in that space is a coming together of those two groups a bit more. 
Now, the trickier one, which is, that's why I saved it for last, is around offenders and how we handle offenders. And I guess I'd like to think that we don't have to wait for the court system to get, I guess, so there's a similar thing in terms of pressure to change the court system. It's not my area as much, so I don't know about it as much in detail, but there have been pushes to change aspects of the court system. And so again, I think that within and without thing does apply that um, supporting people who are working within the system to create change as well as demanding for change without. And I think that the other thing is that not waiting for the court system to change either. Um, and so again, that's where we can kind of think about, well, what can we do um, that doesn't require change in the court system? And, and maybe it is about taking the conversation away from what's legal and doing some of that foundation work around the social norms. Um, kind of stuff. Um, but then I can see how court systems and those decisions are kind of do also send messages to society about what's acceptable and what's not. Yeah. Um, well, in, in the cases of children that we explored a few months ago, it, it keeps putting people in unsafe situations as well. So um, we've got you know, the you know, the, the increased trauma from going through court, but sometimes actually being mandated to go back into unsafe situations. So but it's, I think, as you say, it's a, it's a interesting, tricky, I think there's some really interesting exploration of what, how the, how the different systems reinforce and, and support each other. Mm -hmm. so what is the resistance to change a system and why aren't we able to do it and what's the underpinning motivation to keep the system in place? I, th um, that's, I think something really useful for us all to grapple with is how is the system kept in place? What is the motivation for it not to, to change? So, yeah. mm -hmm. And how do you work with it? And I think, yes. you know, um, and it's the same thing in terms of working with people is that is to say, okay, this is where this institution is. Can we'd like to get them here? Can we get them here first and see that as a win and then get them here and then, you know. Now, before everyone disappears, one thing we forgot to do is if um, everyone could fill out a lovely can feedback form. Sorry, I forgot to do that earlier when we finished. Um, but we put the form in the chat and we're coming to an end. But if you could fill that out there, I'm seeing um, what prompted me is seeing lots of people saying thank you and um, great conversations and um, other things. So. And I think there's so much more to, uh, this has been a ex really exciting one, uh, one hour and 20 minutes now because so, we went a little bit over time. But there's so much to grapple with. And I think this is giving, uh, and I'm finding some scaffolding or some ways also to talk what I found exciting to bring more people to the table and see us how we can be, how each of the pieces of the cake can actually support each other mm -hmm. to get to the place that we want to get to and mm -hmm. really, um, counter some of the the um, resistance or the the not talking across each other not talking the same language I think that this is what I'm finding really useful being able to explain yes I'm on the bottom tier of the cake and you can be at the top of the cake but we're all going in the same we're all at the same table and we're all going to have a delicious meal that's right yeah yeah that's another <laughs> way of putting it <laughs> yeah so um thank you for that are there any last comments from you and um having lots of other people texting through thank you very much um thank you so much melanie any last oh. comments or thoughts from you before we wrap up today oh just um well thank you to you miriam and to lily for inviting me here to talk um it was i really enjoyed the process of putting together the presentation which helped me kind of refine some of my thinking and what i really hope is that this is just the um beginning of um, some more conversations where we can kind of work through this. This isn't intended as that this is the way things, you know, should be or the answer, but more, um, I hope in some ways I've opened up more questions than answers so that we can continue to move through. That might be an invitation if people do have lots of questions, um, you'll have access to my email and it might be we set up a Q&A panel discussion later and delve more into these questions because they're excellent questions that we need to grapple with because this is a complex issue to solve Absolutely. and having lots of collective thinking and and deep challenging conversations and 
interesting, inspiring conversations all at the same time is so important. So thank you for your contribution and bringing this to the forefront. And I quite like cake, so. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Thanks a lot. We'll close with a karakia. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you for bringing um, some really great research. And we'll send the slides out with um, an email once the um, once the uh, video is live. And we'll close with a karakia. We're sending everyone on their way um, so that you can leave here safely. And I uh, will just remind everyone if anything did come up from this presentation, feel free to get in touch with Safe to Talk or you can also email me directly. Um, but go well, wonderful um, trailblazers in this great work of sexual violence prevention, which is so needed. And we'll end with a karakia. Unihia, unihia, unihia ki te uru tapanui, ki a wātea ki a māma, te nākau te tīnana, Te wairua i te ara takata, ko i ara e rongo whakaia a ki ki runga. Ki a tīna, tīna, huie, tai tie. Go well everyone and we will see you all at the next presentation.